a good discussion increases the dimension of everyone who takes part with this let's start our panel discussion on the topic acute ischemic stroke concept controversies in its management moderator for our today's discussion is dr soham desai he is affiliated as senior consultant neurologist professor and head of neurology shri krishna hospital he is editor of aian and aomd journal he is honored with several awards and recognition he has more than 75 publications and book chapters so i invite you on stage good morning all i would like First to invite panelists for our session dr devan juneja director institute of critical care medicine max super speciality hospital new delhi dr mansi dandanayak consultant intensivist kd hospital ahmedabad dr kayur patel interventional neurophysician health one hospital ahmedabad and anand dr himanshu patel consultant neurophysician anand so good morning all and i think before i start i think i have to uh, clap for our critical care team anand and karam sir i think they have done a, a wonderful uh, job organizing this conference in this region and i welcome the panelist uh, for our discussion so uh, the topic which was given to me was acute ischemic stroke concepts and controversies i thought acute ischemic stroke whole is a like big topic we'll focus on hyper acute management so like when uh, in this conferences when we plan panel discussions generally they are like scripted like we have our uh, shows on the tv so they all meet and say we'll discuss this this is things so uh, when i approached them i i we they we formed a group and we said what will you do and i, I posed some questions so they said oh, we are okay whatever questions you ask sir we'll answer so i said that that that's very good i think so i think there are two ways to just do theoretical discussions or we take up cases pose questions ask opinions and i stir controversies here and up, after that we'll have some concepts which especially the residents can uh, have concepts which they can remember and implement in practice so basically it will be like what do we do so ima imaging i'll give scenarios you all say to me uh, which imaging to do so ct ct angio ct intracranial angio head and neck angio mri plain mri plain mri brain head and neck angio Off only or with contrast, we'll see whether we thrombolyze the patient or not. We'll discuss whether we do mechanical thrombectomy or not, and or any other things which we want. And the panel is also rich. We have critical care doctor, we have neurologist, we have interventional person too. So I think this will be good. So this is the first case. So we have a male who is 50 year old who has hypertension and diabetes. Uh, the doctors are like in the ICU. The trauma uh, uh, medical officer calls. that we have a sudden onset right face arm leg weakness patient is able to understand and speak his gaze is normal this has happened one hour before the onset and he has present one uh, within one hour so what do we do next so uh, maybe some, somebody can like do we have mic for the panelists yeah so anybody so what do we like to do next hello yeah uh, so this is left mca acute hyper acute stroke and one hour 60 minutes so i would straight away go for uh, ct if at all required then ct angio otherwise straight away thrombolysis so priority would be thrombolysis rather than uh, imaging the brain once you are sure of stroke and contraindications are ruled out and okay. then next phase if patient doesn't improve then angio and uh, next mechanical mt will come into the picture okay any any from like yes. the panel would have uh, to the thoughts to rule out the stroke mimics uh, additionally for the audience as you mentioned that Correct. there are residents so, in the audience so as as uh, dr antan started where is the stethoscope where is the history So yeah, we, do just we have a, all the history yeah, here? Just one, just yeah. to stir some controversy, and because the topic is controversies, I would. Uh, I am working in a tertiary care hospital, and a lot of medical legal complaints are always there. So you should always keep those things also in mind. I would definitely get a CT scan done before I thrombolyze this patient. So yeah, CT scan would be there. So, But before that, uh, as Dr. Mansi said, 
what if i say the history was that patient had transient uh, tonic clotic movement in the right upper limb lower limb 10 minutes before the, this all happened and now the patient is improving so the first thing as dr bansi pointed out whenever we see uh, these are like we have to work on our spinal level so first thing all remember all residents differentiate mimics from stroke so these are the important mimics which we all should remember so seizures are one we always we have to ask whether there was some history of any transient focal event which happened at that time or not headache lot of times sometimes patient with migraine can have hemiplegic migraine so they may present like this other is functional disorders what if the patient sugar was 30 the, you give sugar and patient completely improves and he had a history of old stroke in the past and this was just a recruitance uh, because of hypoglycemia so that, that others too so these are all i have mentioned so first of all before jumping into that whenever somebody has right sudden right uh, weakness or focal deficit think of my mix that is the first step uh, which we'll look at so we continue so now all the things are ruled out his pulse is normal blood pressure is normal sugar is normal ec is normal no seizure history no fever no drugs which can cause sedation which may lead to transient deficits so now we come to so here the question was do we do ct head and neck angio or mri head and neck angio sir uh, just based on the symptoms uh, patient is able to speak and understand and the gaze is normal which tells us that there are no cortical signs involved so this most likely is not a large vessel occlusion this probably is a stroke from a small vessel occlusion so i would not rush into getting an angio uh, either CT or MR angio, just a plain head CT would suffice and then I would proceed with thrombolysis. Perfect. So another important thing is from the history and examination, the next step we should do is try to localize where the problem could be. Is it a small vessel disease? Is it a large vessel disease? Are we thinking that this could be a bleed? Are we thinking this infarct only? So that is what Dr. Kavir pointed out. The next thing is if you, if you are doing a CT scan, CT angio will take mainly about 5 minutes more. So and if we have that idea, sometimes some patient with large vessel disease may have only initial symptoms, maybe just the beginning only herald hemiparesis symptoms. So if still we can get vessels imaging, CT would be good. Lot of times the mistakes people do is that CT scan in the first one hour may come normal. So what the relatives will say, the patient is always worried. The CT scan normal hai, to relatives will say that MR is normal, hai, CT scan normal, infa kaha hai, asi kuch kar rahe treatment. This is what the people worry. So always remember, our goal is not to show that the problem on the image to the patient relative. Our goal is to get treatment fast. So get appropriate imaging early. Why is it required? Because this is like Formula One race car. And we have to work as teams. Why is it? Because we have to work and try to get a quick door to needle time. Door to needle time, the patient comes to the door of the emergency to we give injection. Why is it required? So like five years back they say they used to say that we should do it in one hour now they say within half an hour we should do this the reason is time is brain so like if you look at this is the chart with progressive time the ischemic area there is a penumbra and there is the oligohypomid area so if we can open up the vessel early there's higher chance that we'll be able to save much much more brain and as you can see if you look at thrombolysis the maximum effect it may be possible within three hours if it takes still a bit liberal up to four and a half hours after that will not work and a lot of times when we say it is four and a half hours it doesn't mean we make it things run slow because the more delay we cause in doing giving the therapy we are losing more and more brain tissue so if we look at if we are able to thrombolyze the patient within 90 minutes the number needed to treat is four if we take it up to three hours number needed to treat is nine and if we take it up to four and a half hours, number of it is 14. So the effect of the therapy actually reduces as we are slower to deliver therapy. So this is like whole maze from the moment patient comes to emergency to we thrombolize. There are multiple things. So the main problem is getting imaging early. So this is the main important thing. So like we do a CT head and NGO, but where are the, what are the conditions where an MRI would be important? Can, can our panelists say, uh, give an idea like, here in this setting, we'll do a CT head and angio. We are going to talk about that, what we did. But what are the scenarios where we'll say that no, CT is not enough, I'll need an MRI. I think beyond the uh, window period, uh, between four point, more than three hours, between nine hours, MRI would be crucial with the perfusion scan, diffusion scan. Okay. Wake up strokes? Yeah, wake, wake up, up strokes. Yes. Correct. 
So there are some conditions where a CT plane will not suffice. So like I have listed some, some of them. So when patient comes with partially recovery deficit, so they'll say that ghar pe jada se weakness on the way, patient is improving. Now we want to say whether it is actually infarct or just a TIA. Here again, it was important. Some patients come with hypoglycemia, we treat hypoglycemia, but still some deficits still remain. Now we are not sure whether it was just hypoglycemia or it could be a stroke too. When there is a history of seizure, sometimes ischemic stroke patients may have seizures at onset. So somebody has a seizure doesn't mean that it is a seizure, MRI is important. When somebody has subacute symptoms, so like I say sudden, when we say ischemic stroke, the classic history is sudden, but sometimes it will be a bit delayed history will be there. When we are, we'll think whether it is a space or collision, is it CVT, is it demyelination, when we have such doubt. And as like Paul rightly pointed out, wake up stroke, when, when we don't have the history of onset to time, MRI can help us know uh, what time is. This is like if your center has a CT perfusion, we can in that go for CT perfusion too. And then beyond four to six hours, it can be center preference. So like some, there are some centers who may like to have MRI, so then it is okay, then they will proceed for MRI. But these are the some conditions. So basically for the first six hours, CT sit in head and neck is a workhouse. For the ones uh, like more than six hours, as they said, we'll need MRI. And sometimes when the patient has already baseline promorbid conditions, we are not thinking of doing mechanical thrombectomy, many comorbidities, CKD, ESRD, mal advanced malignancy, there maybe we can just directly go for MRI when like patient has malignancy, we are not sure it is stroke only or something else. So then we can like ease out and do MRI. So again, so now we did the same patient. Uh, now we have some more information, NIHS is nine. So NIH is something which all patient is stroke, we should do this uh, NIH scale to document the stroke severity. This also helps us in doing prognosis. So here it is nine, and as uh, Dr. Kevur was showing that the patient doesn't have aphasia, doesn't have a gaze problem, is likely to be not a large vessel disease. So as uh, we were expecting his CT head and neck angio uh, is normal, CT is normal. So now the question comes, what next do we do? MRI, EEG, thrombolysis, or just give aspirin, clopidogrel, LMWH, statin, or anything else? If there are no contraindications, thrombolysis. Okay, I think this is clear. I think there's no, no point discussing or no controversy here. LMWH in a dose of twice a day has no role in acute stroke management. This still, this is well, well proven, but still unfortunately continues at lot of centers. So that is the point I wanted to highlight. So thrombolysis. So next we say, okay, thrombolysis now where we have two agents. One is altiplase, other is tenectoplase. Or what we have, we have only two brands in India, Actilize and Atenectase. Or in short we call RTP or TNNP. So now, what drug will we choose? Uh, there is uh, obviously increasing evidence regarding the use of Tenectoplase. And, uh, but uh, still I believe because of uh, our experience with Altiplase for a prolonged period, more in most of the centers people are still uh, using Altiplase. Uh, there are certain advantages of using tenecteplase that is a single bolus dose and uh, obviously uh, we'll be discussing and and most importantly cost is always a factor tenecteplase is much cheaper than altiplase so even if you look at the recent guidelines they also suggest that uh, tenecteplase can be used but uh, that guidelines came up in 2019 and after that also there have been so many papers which have suggested that at least tenecteplase is having it at least uh, as efficacious as altiplase so maybe the next guidelines might change that. I'd like to add two pointers just from my personal experience. Uh, number one is that Tenecti plays is somehow available in periphery also because of their use in MI and PE. Uh, so Tenecti plays is available in periphery much more easier uh, than Actilize. Uh, so uh, when we do a uh, teleconsult or a tele-stroke, uh, I think uh, getting tentative place is easier. The drip and shift works better also because it's just a uh, single bolus rather than giving a 10% bolus and then an infusion like we do in Actilize. Tentative place is a single uh, bonus, uh, bolus, so that, that works. And the second thing, uh, what we personally do is uh, DCGI only has tentative place approved for now up to only three hours. 
and for the three and four and a half hours only actylize is approved that may change very very soon based on what i'm uh, hearing from this uh, the company but f what we do is up to three hours uh, we give tenective plays and then the extended window from three to four and a half hours we give actylize that's just our uh, personal experience we also seen that tenective plays uh, has a better recanalization rates especially in the large vessel occlusions the data from extend ia study in australia also supports uh, supports the same you all have nailed it. I think uh, we, can, uh, we can go ahead. I think as you all said, efficacy and harm, they are all, both are equal. Numbers uh, tested are also now, now equal. And this COVID time, the two are years where patient wanted to shift the patient out of the emergency early so that the COVID patient come up. Lot of patient, like lot, team started using tenectables. So the main difference is if you want to do quick, tenectables is just a bolus injection. So it becomes the whole thrombolysis that we do, triage, medical care, CT, labs, and the treatment, if we use tenect laser, just 30 minutes for everything because the bolus is just one minute job. If we have to use RTPA, it's like a one and a half hour job because RTPA you have to give a part dose bolus and then one hour you have to give infusion. So the patient keeps waiting. So this is a problem if patient has a large vessel disease, you will waste away one hour time before the patient, like if you open up the vessels before. But there are caveats here. Lot of times, tenectablase that is used in stroke is not the one which is approved by DCGI. So DCGI has approved only one brand which is tenectase, which is actually biosimilar, not the original tenectablase which has been tested in countries out, outside India in the trials. The other problem is the dose which has been approved is 0.25 milligram per kilogram in the world. But somehow for India, DCGI has taken a lesser dose, 0.2 milligram per kilogram. And as Dr. Kairo was saying, till last month, it was approved only for three hours. 29 September, DCJ have met, and now they have approved that tenectase can be used up to four and a half hours. So there are some advantages, definitely, but there are still some who prefer tenectase, some who prefer altiplase. But it doesn't make a difference. But tenectase is like lesser costly, and it makes our life easier. So basically, which patients do we select? that we should go for thrombolysis, which we should like may avoid. It's like there are some caveats here. I think, uh, I think I'll, for the lack of time, I'll quickly go through. So if the, pa the patient arrived early, patient is young, his glucose and blood pressure normal, he is on protocol. So all the inclusion experiment criteria are fulfilled. And he has moderate stroke. So like what by moderate, I mean NHS between five to 12. They are the best who are going to improve. Uh, nicely and whose CT is, is like the CT like brain is well preserved. So the other dilemma would be somebody who has minor deficits. So only NIH is one to four, just mild uh, uh, facial weakness, mild grief weakness. What do we do? So there have been two trials which say that for them thrombolysis may not be as beneficial as that. Maybe you can directly go for aspirin four tablets clopidogrel. But the caveat is some of them may deteriorate. You give aspirin clopidogrel weight. And after eight hours, some of them may deteriorate. And then we can't thrombolize because then the window is gone. So here it will be important that we discuss relatives, pros and cons. The others are like the blue ones, the who come a bit late, who are old, who have high hyperglycemia, high blood pressure, they are not for the off protocol. Who have CTs like bad, who have already received anticoagulation before they presented here. Here the blue line is like call K. And if LVO is there, open up the vessel, that can be done uh, up to 24 hours, but there are again a um, lot of ifs and buts. So that brings me to another question. So that we have sorted out that uh, challenge. So the other scenario is, uh, you, this may be like a relative or somebody outside uh, the place where you work, you get a call. So you get a call that there is a patient with 63 year old, hypertensive diabetic smoker. He has sudden right face arm leg weakness. He has lot of speech. He is not able to comprehend and he keeps looking towards his left side. And you are informed on phone. So they ask you, where do we take him doctor? So there is one hospital which is a nursing home for your physician friend who is like 10 minutes away from your home. There is hospital B which is a multi-specialty hospital with full time critical care. CT and MRI are there but we don't have cath lab but it can be reached in 20 minutes. And there is hospital C, which is a comprehensive stroke care center, 24 hour DSA is available, EVT facility is there, but it will take 40 minutes to reach there. So now what, what, uh, what will you give advice on phone here? 
because I'll be a bit biased uh, here. Uh, so I will say C. No, but no, 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 no there is evidence biased, behind it. Just approach like why do you say yeah. so. I yeah. thought he is biased and he will be sending the patient to his friend. <laughs> right. So, so he's uh, <laughs> intervention. intervention. <laughs> he's an intervention guy. He's biased on the other side. So I think the number one thing, uh, again, we are going back to the cortical science based on the presentation, the history, and the examination. Lost speech, so that's aphasia, keeps looking to the left. So patient tends to look towards the side of the occlusion. So all of this right weakness, aphasia, and gaze deviation to the left side force towards a left MCA occlusion. This is an anterior circulation, large vessel occlusion. Uh, IVTPA alone uh, would have a recanalization rates of somewhere around 30, 35 percent uh, at max, even if all the, the right things are done in time. So this patient very likely would probably need an intervention. Uh, this is within, I, I don't see the time here, but I think uh, the time, if it's less than six hours, this is a class 1A evidence. It's a standard of care. There are certain scales like the Ray scale. I, I wrote a paper called the Leg Score. Uh, it's uh, probably under publication when I was a fellow, uh, where you can do an evaluation in the field. This is for the EMS, and not just uh, you can diagnose a stroke, but you can differentiate if it's a stroke from a large vessel occlusion or a small vessel occlusion. This probably patient would have a score of more than four on the Ray score, so this patient would need an EVT. I'm working in Anand. We don't have immediate availability of uh, interventional neurologists. So I would definitely go for CT and time window period is okay. I would straight away do the IVT and arrange for NGO and further workup and further transfer or calling the interventional neurologist to maybe Anand. Perfect. Or we used to involve even interventional cardiologist since 2011. So that can be done. There are so many, uh, like, it's where you are working, what setup, what opportunities you have got, and window period, of course. Per perfect. So yeah. the important point is there are ways by which only from the history we can make out which patients are large vessel occlusion, which are small vessel occlusions, which are likely to be uh, needed different treatments. So that is, as like this is a right scale that you can apply for a right-sided brain lesion or left-sided brain lesion. So, um, I would like to add one point. With the previous case, uh, when you are dealing with hyperacute situation, like one hour, less than one hour, do not waste your time and do not like prevent uh, the patient from getting the benefit of thrombolysis. Exactly. So hyper means if you are wrong, even if it was stroke mimic, if you have thrombolyzed the patient, it's fine. It's not going to harm the patient. Remember that. There are studies which have shown in Europe and America that even if you are wrong, MRI doesn't prove anything, it was HYS, whatever. But don't waste time when it is hyperacute situation like less than 90 minutes, one hour. Okay. Correct. correct. Yeah. So focusing. So from history, we can make out which is large vessel, which is small vessel. There are things on scan which also often the radiologist miss. There is something called dense MCA sign, MCA dot sign, and you can uh, read up about aspect score. And clinically, if there is aphasia, agnosia, gaze deviation, parietal lobe signs, and visual field defect, we can pick up which are large vessel disease. Similar things happen with basal artery. So sometimes patients with basal artery thrombosis may just present with sudden contraparesis and they'll decelerate, which may be interpreted wrongly as seizures. So look into the pupils, the pinpoint pupils will give you an idea that this is basilar artery. So, the, the, so the, the, like we discussed the things, so this is where I, I found the theme of the conference very nicely. We said redefining critical care, think global and act local. So like the problem with our systems is when we talk of discussions in conferences, we talk about what people are doing globally. Where, where the systems of acute stroke care are so well established. You call 911, ambulance comes up, it takes you to where the EMS are the ones who are making a di judgment, where will you take patients. KUR has worked in America. The EMS will take a call using this scale that I'll take this patient to a normal uh, routine stroke care center or to a comprehensive stroke center, just based on school which are well established. What are the meth possible treatments possible? So there is one thing called only thrombolysis in weight, there is drip and shift, as what Himanshu was saying, what we can do in Anand. We thrombolyze and then shift the patient to a where comprehensive, like comprehensive intervention is possible. There is something like directly go for mechanical thrombectomy. 
Actually, there have been five trials in the last two years where they checked between giving thrombolysis IV, then doing mechanical thrombectomy versus direct mechanical thrombectomy. And now there have been two trials where they did, we go for direct mechanical thrombectomy and after that intra-arterially we give TPA in a lower dose to improve the uh, prevent reocclusion after thrombectomy. So the global things are going something where we may, I don't think we may be able to reach 10 years down the line now also. So like if you look at the flowchart that, that uh, this there for acute stroke management. So, uh, look into it, so less than four half halves are no problem, like go for thrombolysis, then look into what CT MRI uh, shows, if it is large vessel occlusion up to, up to 24 hours now, there are selected situations where for large vessel occlusions, mechanical thrombectomy can help patient. This is one thing which is like in the, beyond the tip of iceberg. We are not getting Dutch patients on time at the places. Most of the time, large MCA strokes, we get after second or third day when they start uh, having midline shift effects, mass effects and the symptoms of SCP, where what we can offer is hemicinectomy to save life. Not some treatment where we can uh, improve their mortality, uh, morbidities. So I think, uh, so what would be the answer for this? Again, I come back. The answer I think when, when we don't know, we say, Maybe we shift the patient to hospital B and uh, call the interventional radiologist in the meanwhile. So maybe, yeah, no, cath lab is not available. And then we come to the, uh, if this uh, distance was more than 20 minutes, uh, uh, then we would say go to B first and then trip and shift. Uh, but if it's just 20 minutes, then it makes sense to go to C. Uh, and then we come to know that this patient was actually a manual laborer who works in the field and his monthly income is 5,000 rupees. That is the thing. So the answer to me, the answer here is it depends. So we, we, I think we as a nation, I think need to establish systems of care first. So I, I would like to add to your last point. I think with a lot of efforts from uh, the stakeholders, uh, that PMJ, uh, the National Health a Agency has already included mechanical thrombectomy clusters uh, with good packages in the upcoming revision of PMJ. They are not. Uh, live yet, but I think hopefully they've understood the stroke burden in India and they've understood the importance of this sort of a therapy and to to boost that and to make sure most patients get it without the financial uh, question in, in place, you know. So that is going to change uh, hopefully very soon. So approval will be within the time frame. Oh, good. And the packages have to be good, you know, because some of, like KUR has tried this, some of others across India have tried uh, establishing those models and using the PMJY uh, funds and all, but the problem has been uh, the ones who are trying to help patients actually they suffered losses. I think so. Uh, I think there are still a lot of like this scenario is something where I I posed the five scenarios. Uh, what what could I think we can still debate a lot, but they'll, that may not be relevant to, to what we are having uh, at present locally. Globally, we can still discuss. I think. Uh, we can have more answers, we can look forward to that, but I think we can do that, we look for that, I think we should meet again, I think in the ninth uh, uh, meeting of this critical uh, conferences, maybe next year 2023, I think. And I think I'm on dot on time, I think. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent discussion, all the panelists. I think I hope all the audience must have enjoyed the session. Sure. Uh, the advantage of uh, thrombolysis in time can never be denied, but nobody is talking about the, the the other side of the thrombolysis because that is something uh, you know where you burn your fingers is about the bleeding. So, what in your experience uh, is about the incidence of bleeding because of thrombolysis? Because I remember two three patients where it was very tough. Of course, we explained them before. So, what is your take on that? Like Dr. Swam was also saying, it, the incidence of uh, bleeding is very, very less. So if you choose your patients uh, properly, then the, obviously the risk of bleeding is less than 5%. So, sir, I-score is a score Has which is available. more for oral anticoagulants when yeah. we choose AI. So, uh, you're so uh, the 3% is the bleeding chance, which is like symptomatic. Asymptomatic bleeding is 6%. 
So which is very less, this is even lesser as compared to what we do for thrombolysis of MI. Mm. So problem is, lot of times physicians are worried about bleeding in patients with stroke, mm. uh, more of that. Sure. And because the uh, worry prevents the use, so that further uh, prevents the use. So, That's for well the medical point. legality purpose, I feel that scoring systems are available. You can calculate, you can document, and then proceed for the. Uh, so, bleeding, bleeding is much less. Uh, bleeding is when involved. you are talking about more than three hours. You may go for MRI and confirm micro bleeds are there and cortical based micro bleeds and find out that. And then you may, the patients who have bled badly are either wrongly selected or they have underlying cerebral amyloid angiopathy or something else which was bleeding diastasis. If time permits, one more question, which is clinical. You know, many a times, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen, the hypoglycemia is a real problem. You know, people do come with this, and then uh, if you really jump on to thrombolysis thinking, I think it's too much. Yeah. So, so if so complete so uh, if I, think mimics, I think I would agree with the mimics, because that is something which is very important clinically, rather so, than jumping on to something which may harm the patient or may not be necessary for the patient. So RBS is the only test that I wait for before thrombolysis, unless otherwise suggested from history. So sugar and is... ECG for that acute yes. MI. Yes. So two things are important. Also, I like to say in the Western countries, medical legal questions are happening more when patients are not thrombolyzed. In India, this has started now. Kerala, there have been five cases where physicians were uh, uh, questions in the court because they were not offered thrombolysis. Yes, so that has happened even in Mumbai and Pune. So you are six times more likely to get a lawsuit to miss a thrombolysis, miss a thrombolysis rather than get, doing thrombolysis and in getting a, a bleed, maybe a mimic. Yeah. And, and the numbers we quote is, so in the NINDS trial, the hemorrhage rate was 6.4%. But that is total hemorrhage. That also includes all the PTKA hemorrhage as well. In the analysis after that, which included NINDS and ECAS, it's a SIDS most trial. There the number was 1.8%. So we say less than 2%. Yes, yeah, if the SIDS was registry, it is just 1.8%. So there's nothing actually. Yeah. If we no more questions, I think I'll uh, end here. I think I thank all the panelists uh, for the excellent discussion here. Thank you.